Captain, we've got one more item for you when you get a chance. We'd like it to uh, stir up your cryo tanks. Stand by. Okay, yes, oh, yeah, we've had a problem here. Hey everybody, we've all been there. We've just written a new program, it compiles, it builds, and it's gonna run successfully, and we're hoping it'll fly. And just like things that really do fly, our first couple of attempts don't work so well. For those ones, we load it into a debugger and we figure out what's wrong. But after a while, your program flies. Tower, this is Pigeon Hack 1, we have liftoff. Roger that, Pigeon Hack 1. How was the weather up there? All systems normal. You all look a lot smaller from up here. And it might work for a really long time until eventually something goes wrong. Um, Tower, I have a pointer. It looks kind of strange. Pigeon hack one. Stick with the program. Dereference the pointer. Roger that. Dereferencing the pointer. So debugging programs that usually work can be really challenging because you don't just want to sit there in a debugger for hours and hours waiting for that off chance that it's going to crash. And you can avoid a lot of these cases by thoroughly testing your code before you deploy it, but it's inevitable. Eventually you're going to have some code that crashes out in the field that seems to work almost all the time. And it's incredibly frustrating. And today I want to talk about a tool that can make your job a lot easier when you're dealing with these kinds of occasional, infrequent, or rare crashes. And that's the core dump. If you've been programming for very long, actually, if you've been using a computer very long, you've probably heard the word core dump, but you may not know what it means. And let's face it, the term kind of sounds like the punchline of a dirty Star Trek joke. And so if you've been hesitant to ask, I totally get it. But today I wanna help you see what core dumps are and how you can use them to help diagnose problems that happen out in the field when you're not right there with your debugger. So first off, let's write a program. And for our purposes, it's going to be most helpful if that program crashes. So for fun, let's make this program pick random numbers. And if it ever picks an unlucky 13, it's gonna to try to dereference a bad pointer. And when that happens, it's gonna segfault and crash. And of course, I can make the number range as big as I want, making it less and less likely that it'll crash. But for now, even with it set at 255, it, it takes a while to crash. Okay, so because it's taking too long, I'm gonna speed it up a bit using usleep. That's microsleep, basically sleeps for microseconds. Okay, so now it crashes much more quickly. And you can't always speed software up like this, but when you can, it's a useful tool to get to your bugs faster. Now, when this program eventually crashes, as we knew it would, it says down here that it core dumped. So what does this mean? It means that the computer dumped the contents of the process's memory when it crashed, except for the fact that it really didn't. I'm sorry to break it to you, but sometimes computers lie, and we've just all been lied to. It's so sad because most computers don't wanna go around dumping the contents of every process's memory that crashes, or your computer would just get full of all of these core dumps, and that would be a mess, and the average computer user wouldn't know what to do with them. But you, my friends, are not average computer users, so let's see what we can do to get this computer to start telling the truth. And for my examples today, I'm using Linux. Things may be a little different in other operating systems and even in other shells, but the principles are the same. So first off, let's run ulimit-c. Now, ulimit controls a bunch of different limits on the machine. Dash C says we're talking about the core dump limit, and this sad little zero down here says that the core dump limit is currently set to zero bytes. So core dumps up to zero bytes will be saved, which of course means that we're not gonna save any core dumps. Let's say we change that. Let's run almost the same command, but let's set that value to unlimited. Now it's gonna save everything all the time, and then let's run our program again. Now we do get a core dump. That's this not so little file called core down here in our directory. And it's pretty big, almost 400K for one of the world's simplest programs. And that's why they're turned off by default. You could fill up your disk pretty quick, especially with how frequently your code crashes. But what is that file? It's essentially just a snapshot of the program's memory at the moment that it crashed. It's almost like that little black box that they put in airplanes. And so when an airplane crashes, you can actually go find out what happened. It basically gives us a little glimpse into the last moments of a process's life, and that can be super helpful to see what happened and what caused the crash. And of course, what better way to inspect the last moments of a dying process than with a debugger? That's how we inspect crashes normally, so we can look at the core dump in GDB. So for this, we're simply gonna type GDB, just like we normally would, but add the name of the core file at the end. Now this says, I wanna debug this program, but instead of starting at the beginning, I wanna to jump to the moment captured by the core dump file. So it's gonna skip all those hours of successful operation that we don't really care about and get right to that 
wonderful moment when things went down in flames. So when we do this, it immediately looks just like it would have if we had been in GDB when the seg fault occurred. Because we compiled with debug symbols included, we know what line it's on. We can look at the pointer, but we already know that that's bad because we wrote the code. But if we didn't, hey, we could, we could inspect that pointer. And we can look at the code. We can inspect all the variables. And usually in most programs, when you have a seg fault, usually this is enough to tell us what happened. And we might even have enough information right just by looking at this right here to know how to fix it. And that, my friends, is the essence of a core dump. You get debuggability without having to sit in a debugger all the time and wait for a program crash to occur. And after watching this video, you might start to see core dumps more often. You're just using a program, you're writing a document, you're editing an image, whatever, minding your own business, doing your own work, and the program you're using will crash. And occasionally it'll ask you if you want to report that crash to Apple, Microsoft, Adobe, or whoever wrote the software. And either you do report it or you don't report it, but what do you think they're sending to Adobe, Microsoft, or Apple? Well, they could be sending a lot of things. They could be sending statistics on how you use the software. They could send the project file that you were currently editing, but they could also send a core dump. I don't know if they always do, but if I were them, I would. Because I can't imagine anything that would be quite as useful in tracking down the error as the memory contents at the moment that it crashed. If I were them, I would include it, and you can too when you're trying to debug your programs. So next time one of your programs crashes when someone else is running it, it crashes out there in the field someplace and they want you to fix it, have them send you a core dump. If they look at you a little weird, they don't know how to do that, have them watch this video and then have them send you a core dump. And you'll have a much easier time telling what happened and you'll get some insights into how to fix the problem. Just make sure you include debug symbols or the core dump's not going to be that useful. And that brings up one other issue. So my little tiny test program generated a core dump file that was 400 kilobytes in size. So you might be wondering to yourself, how big is this gonna be with a normal program, a complex program with multiple libraries and a lot of different things going on? Is it gonna to be too big to attach to an email? Is it even gonna fit on my hard drive? We don't know, but there's hope. First of all, remember that that memory that got dumped, a lot of it's empty. A lot of it also is from the C standard library that got included, whether you use it or not. And so the size of your core dump file isn't going to scale linearly with the complexity of your program but it will increase with more complex programs because core dump size really has to do with how much memory your program's using right now. Another nice thing to keep in mind is that core dumps tend to compress really nicely. Now, this isn't always gonna be the case, but let's try it out with our example program. That 400 kilobyte core dump file that I generated from my example, that compressed easily down to 19 kilobytes without me doing anything fancy. And that easily fits in an email. Now, let's see what happens with a more substantial program. For kicks, let's just use the Python interpreter. It's a program I have handy that's more complex and that I can just run from the terminal here. Now, I don't know off the top of my head how to make the Python interpreter crash. I don't know of any bugs that just are hanging around in it. If I did, we could use those. But instead, what we're gonna do is we're gonna fake a crash by sending the segfault signal to this process. Oops, wrong one. Okay, so that is gonna make it think that it segfaulted and it's gonna crash and it's gonna core dump, just as if it had segfaulted itself. Now, if what I just did seems at all confusing, I have another video on sending signals to processes. I'll link to it in the description. If it's confusing, go watch that and come back. This will make a lot more sense. But the point is we forced a crash and Python produced a core dump file. And this one is bigger. It's pretty big, actually. It's 3.5 megabytes. And if we try to compress it, it compresses down to about half a meg. It's not quite as impressive as the compression we got out of our little toy random program that just crashed randomly, but it's manageable. And of course, if you're worried about things getting out of hand and producing massive giant files, you can always set a limit using ulimit. Just don't set unlimited, set it to something finite. So that's it for today, core dumps. I hope you now understand what they are and how they can be useful in helping you track down problems when your programs run into trouble, which of course they will sooner or later. And I'll see you in the next video, especially if you subscribe to the channel, if you click the bell, then you'll find out what the next video is all about and it's gonna be great and I'll see you next time.